Okay, well, um, I'll start off and I'm sure other people will um, log in as we go along. Um, so um, today um, we're fortunate to have um, Lord David Willets with us to talk about interge intergenerational fairness. Uh, David, or more formally as he's known, the Right Honourable Lord Willets, is the president of the Resolution Foundation, which is a think tank focused on living standards in the UK and as far as I can see, is, a, is, a, is a, an organisation that is quoted almost daily in The Guardian. Um, before that, David served as a Member of Parliament for Haven't between 1992 and 2015. He was the Minister for Universities and Science in David Cameron's government. And he previously also worked both at the Treasury and at the Number 10 Policy Unit. He's a member of the Advisory Council of King's Business School and is a visiting professor in the Policy Institute at King's College. He's a board member of UK Research and Innovation and chair of the Foundation for Science and Technology. He's also an honorary fellow of Nuffield College, Oxford, an honorary fellow of the Royal Society and the Chancellor of the University of Leicester. And um, his talks today is going to be about um, how the baby boomers have took their children's future. After reading all that, I'm sort of feeling he's taking all of our jobs as well. Um, but um, I'm just, no doubt he'll say something about that. Um, David has written widely on economic and social policy. His book, A University Education, was published by Oxford University Press. And a second edition of his book, The Boomers and the Young Generation, uh, about boomers and the young generation called The Pinch, um, which you can see on the screen here, was published in November 2019 and is available from all good bookshops. And I checked just now, and it's also an ebook um, on Amazon. So there's absolutely re no reason not to get it, even though we're in lockdown. Um, in addition to David, we've also got a student panellist joining us today. Uh, Matthias Grendel is a third year international management student at the Business School with a background in, he's Austri Aust from Austria and a background in mechanical engineering and a focus on strategy and management consultancy in the automotive industry. Through his participation in various academic com committees, he's developed an understanding of current challenges relating to educational matters at King's College. And through his senior position in the King's Business Club, He's developed an understanding of how business and economies interact with each other. And Matthias will be helping me towards the end in uh, moderating any questions from the audience. So um, I'm about to hand over. Um, if you have questions that you'd like to raise, please put them in the questions, the Q&A box, um, and then we'll come to them towards the end of the talk. Um, but without further ado, therefore, I will hand over to uh, Lord Willets to talk about intergenerational fairness. Uh, Brian, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you guys uh, today. Uh, let me start by saying that there clearly is widely accepted now to a belief that we have got a problem in intergenerational fairness. When I first wrote The Pinch over 10 years ago, it was a much more contested idea. I think it's now widely accepted. And if you move to the next slide, you can see the evidence that when, asked if, uh, when older people now are asked if you're worried that... Uh, young people will not have as good a life or a better life than their parents. There's a widespread fear that it will be worse. Uh, and this is very different from the original promise of the intergenerational contract that every generation in a modern industrial business society would be better off than the previous generation. It doesn't look as if we're delivering that promise. And as we go through the slides, you can see the evidence. I'm gonna start with incomes if you go, and then we'll move on to assets. Now, first of all, the basic framework of analysis. I think this chart is one of the most important explanations of changes in British society and economy since the war. This basically tells us how many people are born each year. And you can see in the interwar years in the 1920s and 30s across the UK down to about 700,000 babies a year being born. Um, and then post-war, the baby boom, where there was never fewer than 800,000 being born, and the twin peaks in 47 and 64 when we had over a million babies born. This tells us as these groups work their way through the life cycle, it shapes the economy and society around them. So the fact that there were so few people born in the 1920s and 30s meant that there were fewer people becoming pensioners in the Thatcher years, which meant holding down public spending was more feasible. The fact that there was a big increase in the number of people born immediately after the war is why Carnaby Street was so exciting in the early 1960s. That's when the first surge of people were in their late teens and early 20s. Uh, and the second surge, incidentally, of people born in the uh, mid 60s coincides 20 years later with the poll tax riots 
uh, and the Sex Pistols. So in other words, these large surges or alternatively declines in relative falls in the number of babies born shapes the character of the society around them. And the big boomer generation, I argue in my book, have shaped society. You would Previously, people would have said, faced with a choice between being born in a big cohort or a small cohort, probably better to be born in a small cohort. You know, travel through life, business class, not economy class, fewer competitors in the labor market, fewer competitors in the housing market. The evidence is now the opposite, that in a modern society with democratic voting and market power, being a big generation works to your advantage. So if we go to the next slide, we can start seeing the effect of this. First of all, in pay, and particularly acute since the crash over 10 years ago, you can see how the pay of younger people has underperformed relative to the uh, pay of other age groups. And if we go on to the next slide, you can see also why young people are so badly hit by the crisis today. Um, now, it's always been the case that young people in the post-war period have tended to work in these sectors like retail and hospitality and leisure, which it so happens are worst hit by the crisis. But it's also the case that compared with young people in the last, over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, young people now are even more likely to be concentrated in those sectors than they were in the past. And incidentally, this we think at Resolution Foundation is another reason why their pay has underperformed. They're stuck in relatively low paying sectors, whereas the baby boomers by and large charged into the sectors of the future with relatively high pay. Young people are stuck in relatively low paid sectors and incidentally are much less likely to move jobs than they were. So if we move on to the next slide, please, we can see how this labor market in fact has been reinforced by public policy. This uh, chart tells you how since 2015, changes in working age benefits and pensions, how changes have, have hit different generations. And you can see that essentially the policy has involved cuts in the uh, income of people of working age, uh, on average, about £200 worse off than if their benefits had gone up with inflation. Whereas for pensioners, the policy has been increases in benefits above inflation. Uh, for many of them, more than £200 higher than if they'd just gone up by inflation. So this is public policy, a combination of the uh, freeze in the cash value of many family benefits, plus the triple lock for pensioners. This is a public policy that has reinforced the trends in the labor market. And if you look at the next slide, you can also see what the results of this are. When I started my interest in public policy many decades ago now, it was just assumed that if you were poor, you were likely to be old, and if you were old, you were likely to be poor. Um, that is no longer the case. But a lot of the debate around this whole issue of generational fairness starts on the point of view, well, old people are poor. The truth now, and in many ways, this is fantastic social policy, this is social progress. The truth is a pensioner is no more likely to be poor after housing costs than someone of working age. If anything, slightly less likely to be poor than someone of working age. And when you look at the poorest people down at the lowest 20%, you see again for the, the poorest 20% of pensioners are slightly better off than the poorest 20% of families. So any public policy, in, it would have been the case in the past that a public policy with an age rule, we will do this for people because they're over 60 or over 65 or over 70, would in the past have been quite a good way of targeting low incomes without means testing. Any such rules are no longer effective public policy because if anything, they're helping groups who are doing slightly better than the average. And this is just the income story. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, and uh, now we're going to look at assets. We're now going to focus on two main forms of ownership, the two, main, the two forms that are by far the biggest stores of wealth, uh, housing and pensions. Now, again, it's now become an uh, accepted fact that it's just so much harder for younger people to become homeowners 
than it has been for people of the same age in the past. So this is, this is telling you that if you look at those blue and turquoise lines at the top, this is telling you that the people born after the war, the baby boomers, by the age of 30, 50% of them were homeowners. And it tells you that for the much younger generation, uh, the turquoise and purple lines uh, way down, uh, they'll be lucky if 30% of them are homeowners by the age of 30. So a massive retreat of home ownership. Now, for me as a conservative, I believe in property owning democracy. I want to see ownership of wealth spread. So this is one of the two most important forms of wealth uh, that is not available to younger people in the same way as it was to the baby boomer generation. And this feeds through into the quality of the housing that they live in, as we'll see in the next slide, please. Um, this shows you that they are in many of them, the big surge is in private rented accommodation. Um, and that the red line, which is how uh, families are now, means that we've now got 25%, uh, sorry, we've now got, no, we've now got 35% approximately of uh, women of the age of having their first child who are living in the private rented sector. And again, public policy hasn't just assumed and made assumptions about age, it's made assumptions about tenure. There's been a kind of assumption that most people will end up owner occupiers because for some uh, previous groups of boomers, they, it was getting penetration of home ownership was reaching 70, 75%. Imagine being in private rented accommodation and your kids going to school. The, the sort of security of a long-term link to that neighborhood just isn't there. So there's been a big increase in private rented accommodation matching the decline in owner occupation. Let's move on to the next slide because that will show other effects. Um, people are, young people, if you look at the, at the second line there, those are three measurements from the 1990s to now of how many people um, were in overcrowded accommodation. And it shows a big increase in the number of people in their 20s living in overcrowded accommodation. Uh, they are more likely to be in overcrowded circumstances than they would have been in the past. Uh, and we at Resolution Foundation recently produced a report on the effects of the virus crisis. And of course, we know that the the health effects, the physical health effects are most acute for old people. We know the labor market effects are most acute for young people. What we showed in addition was that the mental health effects were worse for young people. And the argument was they're the ones in the most cramped accommodation. They're the ones with occupying less physical space than older people and indeed less physical space than younger people would have had in the past. They're less likely to have access to a garden. It's particularly tough if you're locked down. And this is the empirical evidence for this, showing the increase in overcrowding. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, and this brings together what I've been saying about uh, household wealth, housing wealth, which is the purple block, and there you can see it. This is, of course, net of mortgages, after mortgages, uh, that the boomers own um, two trillion plus of housing. And the millennials own about less than, far less than that, a tenth of that. Um, but in addition, there's the turquoise line of pensions. Uh, and pension wealth is very significant as well. We're going to turn to pension wealth in a mo moment. But you can see the if you put those two assets together, plus financial wealth in other forms, that's normally things like so bank accounts, deposits accounts, savings accounts, adds up to 6.5 trillion of wealth owned by the baby boomers. Now, to some extent, there is a life cycle effect here. Yet it is absolutely the case that in many societies, you would expect someone aged 60 to have more wealth than someone aged 30 during people's working lives they do acquire wealth, they acquire pension rights, they quite like to buy a property and gradually pay off the mortgage. But the argument in my book and the evidence that we have from Resolution Foundation and the way I constructed those slides earlier is this is not simply a life cycle effect, there is also a cohort effect. There is the younger generation now having things tougher than young people did uh, when they were the same age 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. That's the issue. This is a life cycle effect 
with a very powerful cohort effect thrown on top, as we will see in the next few slides. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, as well as housing, the other big asset is pensions. Uh, uh, older people and older workers, uh, many of them had defined benefit pension schemes, which promised them a pension income as a percentage of their final salary uh, for the rest of their lives. Those are very generous pension schemes. And, and look, I was part of this process. It's one of the things that first set me thinking about generational fairness. All through the last 20, 25 years, through Parliament, under successive governments, we have regulated to improve and increase the company defined benefit pension promise. We've added price protection. We've added protection for widows or widowers. Uh, we've added protections for early leavers. We've given it the, the absolute protection of being unambiguously private personal property. So the regulation has taken what was already quite a generous promise and made it more generous. It's had one fundamental disadvantage though. It's led to companies closing those schemes for younger workers who are instead on completely different defined contribution schemes where you build up a pot of money, but there's absolutely no guarantee of what income it will provide uh, during your years in pension. So what we boomers did when we passed those regulations was we turned the company pension scheme as an intergenerational scheme into a once off special offer for our generation, never to be available for any future generation. And these defined benefit, con defined contribution schemes have much lower levels of company contributions and will provide much less security when people are older because there is no link to final earnings. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, and uh, this is another example of the cohort effect I was describing earlier. So of course, initially, um, these boomers had got uh, a big share of wealth, but this is before the crash. This is the, the turquoise blocks. But since the crash in the last 10 years, the increase in wealth has particularly benefited those boomers, people born in the 1950s and early 60s. So things like quantitative easing, which has been one of the factors driving up house prices, has been of greatest benefit to people who were the most likely to be property owners. So you've seen over the past 10 years a reinforcement of this trend. Those cohorts that had already got wealth through housing have seen it rise in value. And those who'd already got pension promises from companies to pay them an income in their uh, retirement, those as, as interest rates have fallen, discount rates have fallen, those promises have become ever more valuable. So there's been a particular extra twist to the phenomenon I've been describing in the last decade. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Um, and this is just telling us again in a different way how the wealth of so much greater of people of those cohorts born in the 50s and 60s and how over five-year periods it has grown very significantly whereas over a five-year period the wealth of the young, much younger cohorts has not increased significantly it is way below that of older cohorts so let's move on to the next slide and um i've now painted a picture of younger generation having a raw deal in the jobs market, the younger generation having a raw deal from the tax and benefit system, the younger generation having a raw deal in housing, and the younger generation having a raw deal in pensions. That is the backdrop to my final slides, because it's the backdrop to the question, the challenge we face for the future. Um, and especially post the virus, that challenge comes in many forms, but one of the most vivid forms, which I'm sure we'll be hearing a bit about from the Chancellor on Wednesday, is the fiscal challenge. And this, this chart here tells you how simply because of the boomers growing older, this big, and that's not just an aging phenomenon, that's because they're a big cohort. This surge of the big cohort through the jobs market drove the dynamism of Britain in the 80s and the 90s. Now they are reaching pension age, and that puts pressure on social security spending, though that is partly offset by a very enlightened policy of the uh, its slow increases in pension age. 
but also on healthcare. Uh, and this is an interesting chart compared with charts from some other advanced Western countries, because I'm not here describing a uniquely British phenomenon. But what is unusual in Britain is how less of the impact of this big cohort aging, probably rather less throws, shows up in pensions and rather more in healthcare than in other advanced Western countries with slightly different uh, uh, systems for funding healthcare and pensions. This is a pre-virus chart, but even this chart tells you that public spending on the welfare state in the UK is now on an upward trend driven by underlying demographics. Um, I worked for Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, and if you look at the demographics then, you find the demographics is a surge in the number of young people, lots of new entrants to the jobs market. It's an environment where you can radically restructure your society, and with relatively few pensioners and relatively few children, it is an environment where you can hold down public spending. This, by contrast, is an environment where upward public spending pressures are great. So the question is how to pay for it. And the next slide is the one which gives a very useful clue. Um, because this is, if you look at the line uh, on the, up, the upward black line, this is telling us that in the last 40 or 50 years, uh, well, really it began from about 1980, the last 40 years, we've had a steady increase in the value of our wealth relative to GDP. That surge in the value of houses and that surge in the value of pension uh, promises has increased our wealth from three times GDP to seven times GDP. So this is, a, and I think this is a profound change in the character of British society. This is why the point when you try to use income to buy an asset, which the most widespread form is trying to buy a house out of your income, is so much harder. Assets are much more expensive relative to income than they used to be. This is also incidentally a society where inheritance matters a lot more. Those dreams of increased social mobility, inheritance becomes a more significant way of securing an asset, earnings becomes a less significant way of securing an asset. So I'm very uncomfortable with a society where that's been the change in the asset to income ratio. Um, but look at the lower block. And the lower block is the percentage of GDP collected in taxes on property, of which by far the, uh, the, uh, the biggest, incidentally, uh, is some of the um, count is poll tax um, and council tax. The, the dip, that mysterious disappearance of the dark blue over the period in the early 90s is the poll tax saga. So we have, even whilst capital has been rising relative to GDP, there has been no income in capital tax revenues relative to GDP. And Britain, by far Britain's biggest uh, property tax is council tax, which it so happens is an incredibly badly designed tax, which itself is very regressive, where um, relative to income, someone in a property worth 100 or 200,000 pounds is paying much more in council tax than someone in a property worth a million pounds. So we're a low capital tax society, and the main capital tax we've got, council tax, is very badly designed. This is the backdrop to the attempts of the Treasury in the last few months to open up a debate about capital taxes. Now, I don't hate wealth, I don't hate people for being rich, I don't desire to increase taxes, but when you think of that earlier evidence about the growing cost of the welfare state and the evidence about the incomes of younger people, compared with the wealth of older people, my view is it is reasonable if this burden is to be paid for, and a lot of that healthcare and pensions will we go to the older generation, if they are also disproportionately holders of assets, it seems to me reasonable to them through taxes to pay a contribution towards the cost of the very services on which they will depend. And that seems to me only, that seems to me to be what fairness between the generations is all about. And if you turn to the next slide, you will find, I think, one of the most eloquent statements of that principle by Edmund Burke. It is what holds a society together, the contract between the generations. And my generation, the boomer generation, are in danger of breaking that contract by enjoying unusual benefits for ourselves and making life tougher for our children. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, David. That was um, um, intriguing, and um, I'm a uh, I'm a Generation Xer, so I think I'm sort of uh, 
partly happy and partly unhappy by those outcomes. But I suspect an awful lot of the people on the call are unfortunately in the millennial cohort and it was nothing but bad news almost for them. Um, so um, instead of kind of um, going through and commenting explicitly on the particular um, aspects, I thought I would ask you some questions that would kind of um, spurt things that puzzled me or kind of I would be interested in. So the first is the international question, which is that you touched on at the very end there in terms of the potential effect on the health service and on social security. But a bigger question I had was, are the, the general is the general story of the baby boomers taking everything to what extent is that true in all other countries um partly because it's just interesting to know what the international story is but also of course it might help us think about causes and consequences of it yeah i mean the the fundamental <laughs> argument uh in my in my book and in this presentation would apply to advanced liberal democracies. So if you look back classically in demographics, they think big generation is bad news. My argument is when you have a welfare state, so significant public allocation of resources, plus democracy, so voters can vote for the policies that work to their advantage, plus a market economy, where being a big group of consumers matters, then if you put all those things together, being a big cohort works very well indeed. And you can see it either in terms of the political drive behind the triple lot for pensions, or you can see it out in the marketplace. It's why the Rolling Stones are still on tour and you can buy an upmarket revamped version of a Mini or a Volkswagen Beetle. So the market power of, this, of these large cohorts is greater. That phenomenon applies across other advanced Western countries. Now, the timing of birth surges and everything differs and how big a gap there is. It's absolutely clear in America, which similarly had a very sharp post-war baby boom. Um, on the continent of Europe, the post-war demographics are a bit different because there were countries like Germany where the destruction was so great that you didn't have a sudden uh, surge in the birth rate in 46, 47. But the core argument is um, it is also the case that across Europe, there's an increased debate about the tough time that the younger generation are having. So I would say it is a, it's a model that applies across uh, the EU, US and other economies with that combination of features I described. Okay. And just to follow on from that, presumably you're very careful to say it's it, those particular types of economy. Would it be fair to say that actually... The, the story is much more positive from a young generation's perspective if you went into some of the more developing emerging economies, because in fact, in some sense, it's, it's the current generation who potentially have it, um, opportunities that 30, 40 years ago didn't exist. Well, that's a very interesting question. And look, there I would, I would say it like this. The, the, the demographic transition, when uh, you have a surge in the population, um, which very crudely one demographer summarized as first we stop dying like flies and then we stop breeding like rabbits. So there's a time when you have still have quite high birth rates, then the birth rate starts falling. That surge of the number of young people is probably the biggest social and economic challenge any society faces. Um, we had a version of it in the post-war baby boom. And as I said, I think in America and Britain, the turbulence of the 60s and 70s was linked to the increase in the number of young people then. Um, it's obviously uh, been a uh, striking in China and <coughs> India, where that has driven in both countries massive economic change and industrialization. The... The debate now amongst demographers globally is Africa. In Africa, that's where this surge in young people is now most obvious. And there's an optimistic and a pessimistic view. The optimistic view is look at the look at innovation in products for mobile phones, in uh, mobile phone banking and financial services. You'll find Kenya and Uganda, global centers of innovation. That's where the young people are. That's where these services are most needed. So there is an optimistic view. There's a pessimistic one that, the, that Africa, as, and as we saw in the Middle East with the Arab Spring, these demographic challenges are very hard for some of these countries to ride and they may not be able to get through the instability of being very youthful. Okay, 
Great. Um, so my second uh, sort of area of questioning is about uh, kind of um, you, you touched on it a bit about um, kind of thinking about the life cycle. And I was thinking, you know, if, if you're an economist, you think you always think into you try and at least always think intergenerationally. Um, but you also remember the linkages across the intergenerations. And so I guess one question is just um, does any of this matter in the in the big picture question of, you know, who owns all the assets, for example? Well, I mean, it could just be that the baby boomers happened to live through a period in which returns were very good. Um, so it's, it's clear that returns on equity markets and in housing, and particularly in the UK, were very strong over the period at which, whether it, whether it was by coincidence or not, um, was when the baby boomers were accumulating those assets. So then they've just done very well by sitting on those assets. But of course, the one thing we can be sure about the baby boomers is that they do have to die. Yes. Um, and when they die, they can't take their assets with them. So they're either going to have, I mean, of course, they may have spent a lot of them, <laughs> their pensions they may just have spent while they're in retirement, but their property they're going to either have to give to the next generation or it's going to be given an inheritance tax and it can then be distributed to the next generation. So to what extent should we just say, yeah, they look like they've done well, but they are going to have to pass it all on. Yeah, well, and, uh, first of all, on the doing well, it certainly looks that they've done well. There are a range of different reasons for it. Um, and uh, there's, I show, you know, QE has certainly been a factor in the last 10 years. I would argue that policies for which they have voted have played a role because, for example, um, property planning rules were much less restrictive in the 60s and 70s when they were young and needed houses, and then they get older and they vote for tightening of planning rules to make it much harder to build houses for the next generation. So there is a, poli a, a policy framework and uh, the boomers are going to live for quite a while, which is a good thing. You know, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> don't hate boomers, and I'm a boomer myself, but this will be on your model. This is a society where first of all, the ownership of the younger generation is much delayed. So Prince Charles becomes the model. You have to wait a long time and inheritance matters so much that wealth becomes more hereditary in the past. Uh, and I think that does change the characteristic of a society in many ways. It's certainly bad for social mobility. And one of the other paradoxes I bring attention to in my book is that lots of modern, modern thinkers thought a feature of modernity was that the family would decline. The family would be a less significant institution. What actually happens in an increasingly age segregated society where you tend to work with people of the same age, tend to socialize with people of the same age, where there's relatively little intergenerational mixing, the family becomes more significant because meanwhile, the family shrinks in size. So you have fewer siblings, but because of increased life expectancy, you're more likely to have your parents still surviving and of course, grandparents. So families become the tall, thin intergenerational bamboos linking an otherwise generationally segmented society. And if through that family stem you inherit wealth, that is a much more powerful way of acquiring it than trying to earn it, given what's happened to the value of wealth relative to earnings. So family, much more important in your scenario. I think, and I think the social mobility thing is really interesting because that's a, a key thing. And then my final question, I guess, is on this, um, you know, what should policymakers do? And as, as you alluded to, it's not just in the UK, but actually globally, um, policymakers are thinking more about wealth taxes of one form or another. Piketty has been very uh, mm. vocal in this. Um, and I guess some, sometimes that, you know, that, that can be phrased in intergenerational fairness question. It can also just be a question of we need to raise revenue and here's a source that uh, we don't raise, and as you showed, don't raise much from. Um, I guess the question is, what would you do? So where would you raise these taxes? Um, what, what would you pick on particularly? Because usually the concern is, I guess there are often two concerns. One is, um, if you start taxing wealth, people will just behave differently going forward. And so you can get some money to begin with, but then eventually they'll just evade it in one more or another. And then I guess there's also the argument that there's something different about um, wealth because it comes out of, or at least historically has come out of our earned income, which was taxed in the first place. So is it then fair to tax us again on our wealth accumulation? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, um, as I say, I don't like putting up taxes. I'd much rather one didn't have to. But uh, my view is if you have to put up taxes, then capital taxes are a, uh, a, a place, uh, will be an inevitable and should be part of it. Um, there are different ways you could design them. Uh, you could 
aim to collect a bit more from capital gains tax, which is what's on the agenda at the moment. Though uh, you're right, Brian, I fully accept that there is a behavioral response, the so-called Laffer curve. Now, and the Laffer curve, uh, when uh, the point which the curve where you, it starts uh, going down again after the point at which you maximize your revenues from a tax, it may be the case that for some of these internationally mobile people, the Laffer curve has a different shape for capital taxes than it does for income taxes. But uh, nevertheless, it should be possible to collect more in capital gains tax. When you look at how you meet the social care crisis, I think it is reasonable to expect people who are in valuable properties to make some contribution to the costs of their care, probably with, with a cap, um, out of the value of their property, a charge which could be on their estate and paid after they die. And so it's not a, something they have to find out of cash today. Um, so those type of policies come on the agenda. I also don't like the pensions triple lock. If you have to save money, it seems to me that's a place to start. Uh, and also you have to liberalize the planning regime so it's easier to build new houses. Uh, you might look at ways in which you can provide more significant exchequer top-ups to the amount of money that younger people are putting into those defined contribution pensions. So there's a range of policies that you can look at to tackle uh, and deliver fairness between the generations. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Matthias now uh, and uh, hopefully he has a question or two and then we'll uh, turn over to the uh, audience. Yes, thank you, Brian. Um... And thank you, David, for, for the insights. Um, I was just going to wonder, as we students are probably the, the society or the generation that will be most affected by those, um, those social policies you mentioned, um, do you think that, I mean, you mentioned or you talked a lot about housing and um, buying houses or buying property will be... Um, a way for a solution or will be one of the solutions in future. So um, I was just thinking from my perspective and from what I'm observing here and around here, there are more and more co-living spaces, more and more shared living spaces now built up that are specifically targeted to solve the overcrowded issue you mentioned and to solve housing in a way that they rent instead of, um, in, instead of sell property. So do you think the shift in preferences for students and the shift in preferences for young professionals and younger people that want that extra flexibility has an impact to less housing and less property being bought over the recent years? Well, that is a very good and, and fair question. And um, which is essentially, uh, to what extent is there a change in behavior driven by shifting preferences amongst young people? To be honest, this is quite often what the boomers say. This is how we boomers ease our conscience. It's not that we've made it hard for young people to get started on the housing ladder. It's young people don't want to own a house anymore, so it's all all right. Um, the attitudinal research that I've seen, and uh, I've uh, done a, a lot of work, including that Resolution Foundation in partnership with Ipsos Mori, does show that in some areas, young people have lost the appetite to own. They've certainly lost the appetite to own a motor car. The days when everybody aspired to have a great big, piece of metal stuck outside of uh, their flat or house on the pavement, next to the pavement for them to own. Car ownership amongst young people is falling massively and their attitudes are shifting against it. The evidence on home ownership is that it's still, however, a widespread aspiration. The trouble is it's harder to fulfill. Um, they may, people may want to wait a bit longer. Uh, and certainly there is some very interesting housing from that, uh, flat offers which are based on the sort of student accommodation model. But the attitude and evidence is quite clear. People would by and large, especially when they start having kids, wish to have the security of owning their own place. Okay, thank you very much. And adding to that question in some sense is um, that you, uh, or if you think that uh, instead of home ownership, there might be other investment um, opportunities that might get more attractive in future. Uh, I'm just referring to people having more access to um, different financial service than they hit, did have in the past probably, and um, people having access to different, um, different types of investment, uh, also in, in lower income brackets. So do you think that people prefer investing or that investing in other uh, assets would be a viable solution as well? Yeah, I mean, that is one way forward. Um, you need a flexible range of, 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 
forms of wealth that people can hold. Um, but uh, so far, the evidence is just almost regardless of what of the form of wealth, it's just there's less of it amongst young people. So the uh, the uh, we don't need, probably don't need to go back to it, but the slide that showed young people with less housing wealth and less uh, pension wealth, they've also got less kind of financial wealth in the classic form. But I don't want to be all a pessimist. The good news, which is very relevant for your question, Matthias, is the success of auto enrollment. Uh, now, that means that younger people have now got, many of them are in this vehicle of auto-enrolled uh, personal pension pots. The bad news is there's not much money in them, but the good news is that they have got this savings framework. And I think another interesting area of policy is both are the ways we can top up that wealth, are the ways in which the exchequer can put more in, because there's already a bit of a contribution for the exchequer and a bit for the employer, and indeed, can it be made more flexible? So, for example, you can borrow against it to put down a deposit when you want to buy your first flat or house. So there is a framework there, not with not bearing much weight at the moment, that could in the future become a vehicle for the, some of the types of saving that you're envisaging, Matthias. Okay, thank you, David. And uh, probably one question to final finalize it from my side and hand it over to the students question and to the Q&A session would be tying into some uh, somewhat what Brian said before um, that baby boomers have to die at some point. Um, I was thinking or a question that came to my mind in that moment was don't we as young people have more access to let's say education and let's say say uh, other other access um, that we didn't or that baby boomers didn't have at their time and doesn't this access to education help us to build our wealth in the long term? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's a very fair point. And look, first of all, the wheels of modern welfare state capitalism and business innovation have not stopped turning. Um, GDP growth is not as fast as it was, and it's had the hit of the financial crisis and now the terrible hit of the virus. Um, but we are in a society that is still on a trend, very slowly becoming more affluent. Um, and eventually young people should be able to enjoy the benefits of that. I have to say, when you look in detail at consumption, you find actually that consumption, absolute amounts of consumption among people in their twenties now, are no higher than, or possibly even slightly less than, the amount of consumption done by people in their 20s 15 years ago. The big surges in consumption among people in their 50s and 60s, that's where there's a surge in eating out, surge in travel, things like that. But, but nevertheless, you know, this is a, I'm a believer in economic growth, um, but the, uh, an education does indeed equip young people, uh, and it's one of the best single trends around working in their favor. But it does look as if at the moment in the labor market and elsewhere, they're not enjoying the full returns to this investment that one would hope to see. And there's a lively debate about whether that's, it's partly just because of the environment since the financial crash of 2008-9, but it looks like it could be a longer term trend as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm now gonna hand over again to Brian, um, who will introduce the Q&A session. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to broadly just read out these questions and uh, get your response. So the first one was from Ionis, uh, which was that um, today prior generations um, are dismissed as out of touch, often in an ironic manner. Would it be a surprise or even possible to say that younger generations form closed mind opinions around the way business is done and technology? Well, um, here I'm... I'm a bit of an optimist. I mean, the odd thing about this, these generation gaps is that there's a massive economic and financial gap between the boomers and our uh, kids. The evidence is when you try to look at changes in social attitudes over time, the real gap is between the boomers and their parents. So on a host of uh, indicators, 
the big revolution was that surge of young people in the 60s and 70s who drove a massive liberalization of Western societies where that demographic change happened, notably the US and the UK. Um, and on many social indicators, the attitudes of those boomers is not that different from the attitudes of their children and perhaps even grandchildren. In, in other words, culturally, parents and children, if anything, are a bit closer than they were. That ties in with my theme of the growing importance of the family. Uh, and of course, that's partly indeed being cynical about the financial dependence. Given the rise of the bank of mom and dad, it's quite unwise to row with your bankers. But never, and young people have to live with their parents for a lot longer, so they're obliged to try to get on with them. But my view is that the, the sort of attitudinal gap between the generations is less, and the economic gap is getting wider. Okay, uh, great. And uh, the second question, it goes back to this question of social mobility. So um, marginalised people whose families will not realistically be in a position to provide an inheritance to them. Um, won't this just um, allow for a cycle to continue in favour of those in privileged socioeconomic positions and allow for a wider gap in wealth? So there'll just be a almost self-fulfilling process going on here. Um, and um, can that gap be closed? Well, that is indeed one of the warnings from my analysis. That is one of the things that worries me the most because I'm a believer in opportunity and mobility. Uh, so on current trends, as I said, inheritance will matter more and more, uh, but it needn't be like that. And um, I've given some examples of things we could do. Uh, if there has to be increases in taxation, we should certainly look at well-designed capital taxes as an important part of that. And as younger people are building up, the good news is auto-enrolled pensions is creating a financial, a type of financial asset that many young people have. So why not? I mean, we proposed in the Intergenerational Commission at Resolution Foundation, provide every 30-year-old with a capital grant of £10,000 that could be put into that pensions pot and used flexibly. I, I'm uh, not a great believer in universal basic income, a universal basic asset, a sort of capital grant to people at the age of 30, I think would make sense. And it would help overcome some of the barriers that you are rightly worried about. Do you think, just following off on that, that do you think that um, there's any chance really that um, policymakers will be bold enough um, to take it, to take, you know, I think the worry might be that they'll, they'll chip away at some capital gains tax and they'll do a bit more on the capital side, but you won't fundamentally change the fact that if your mum and dad own a house in Kensington, um, you're going to inherit a five million pound property at some point. Um, and they're never going to really change that. And so that, that, that most of this kind of uh, this gain that the baby boomers have got is going to be passed on to the next generation because politically it'll be impossible to chip away at more than a small fraction of it. And so the social mobility thing is, is almost already lost. Right. Well, um... This inherited, I mean, five million in Kensington is an extreme case. Um, and you're right, if you've got that kind of wealth, parental wealth behind you, then uh, whatever um, viable rates of tax, you're still going to inherit quite a lot of wealth. Um, but there's a lot of people in the middle for whom these, the kind of policies I'm describing really would make a difference. And one of the things I found most frustrating when I did the media on our intergenerational commission report a couple of years ago now, and I had this, we had this proposal of a 10,000 pound capital grant. Some of the broadcaster interviewers would say 10,000 pounds, that's not much. You can't get much in London for 10,000 pounds. The truth is 10,000 pounds as a grant given to every person reaching the age of 30 would more than double the wealth of more than two thirds of young people aged 30. And it does help when one of the biggest single barriers to home ownership is getting the deposit. It could help with that. And although, of course, the deposit requirement is going to be much greater in central London, there are significant parts of the country where that really does start getting useful as a way of sitting started on the housing ladder. So um, I, I'd rather, it's a spectrum. And you're right, we can't solve the entire problem, but you, there are useful things we can do. And also just getting more houses built is a useful thing that governments can do.
Um, so just building on that then, uh, a final question for me there on the same sort of question is, um, when you look at the, um, you, you showed some charts that showed that even, you know, the bottom 20% of pensioners um, were now doing better in terms of income than the average. And um, But when you focus just on the wealth side of it, how unequally distributed is that? Are we talking about a world in which essentially even talking about the baby boomers is perhaps a little unfair in that it's a smallish group of baby boomers who have just done staggeringly well? Um, you know, in other words, uh, how is that, um, that right. wealth distributed right. within yeah. that group? Yeah, and it is, uh, and again, it's an, and it's an absolutely... Um, fair line of questioning. Some people say, all right, you're talking about intergenerational fairness, but what about intragenerational fairness? Isn't the big story the gaps that exist within a generation? And look, I, I mean, I understand there are many other dimensions on which one can look at fairness. There's gender, there's ethnicity, there's social class. So there are those differences within generations. I would say in post-war Britain and in the academic debate and in the social policy debate, there's been thousands of books written about class and fairness. And we're very aware, especially now of ethnicity and fairness, the generational stuff was underplayed relative to those other factors. But the just when you were born really does matter. And when you then go down into housing, there you find, when you are talking about boomers who get to, you know, 75% property ownership, and when you get to, over the last decade, given quantitative easing, significant increases in house prices in most parts of the country, you are talking about wealth effects that are quite widespread. Indeed, part of the greater egalitarianism of Britain in the past was precisely that things like home ownership were widely spread. So yeah, this is, um, so although there is some, uh, not many people of any age are going to own five million pound properties in Kensington, nevertheless, if you are age 60, your chances of being a homeowner are, with your mortgage paid off are pretty high, way over 50%. And most of those houses are going to be worth at least a couple of hundred thousand, and some of them significantly more. And I guess, to be fair, you're, the, most of the kind of the policy side of it, it almost doesn't matter whether it's intergenerational or intragenerational. Um, if it's a capital tax that will be paid regardless of, you know, you're not going to, I yeah. guess you, most of your proposals are not for explicitly a tax on someone because they're over 60. It's yeah. because of the assets they hold or the, so if you happen to get a hedge fund manager who also has those assets, then they'll be hit as well. Yeah, so, correct. Yeah. That is true. And, and uh, though I tend they, though you tend to have to, you know, uh, the Treasury likes events as a means of triggering taxes on wealth. And although in theory, although the economists love a tax on wealth full stop, when the Treasury looking at how to secure it, they tend to look at a moment when something happens that could be potentially a taxable event. So you have transaction taxes like stamp duty, you have death taxes like inheritance tax. And I'm arguing you could have some system of paying for social care. And some of those are quite heavily screwed, skewed towards older people. And I guess just uh, taking advantage of the fact that you used to be a full on politician um, before you uh, elevated yourself. <laughs> how, how realistic is it to think that either the current government or future governments will go against a group of people who vote more regularly than the rest of us? Um, and have lots of vested interests. Right. Well, that is a, that's good. And again, I'm not a pessimist. So the, the good news is the different generations care about each other. That's why, although I'm accused often of being a sort of generational warrior, I'm not actually trying to promote generational warfare. Uh, youngsters don't want granny to have a tough time. And granny really cares about her grandchildren. So the, my view is this the argument is winnable by an appeal that the older generations have to the care about the interests of the younger generation. And um, I would give you the encouragement I take is from housing. And what partly got me writing the book in the first place was my experience as a constituency MP when I'd go to residence association meetings full of decent people in their 50s and 60s who were probably governors of the local school and, and public spirited but who were campaigning against a new housing development in the area. And how was I as an elected politician to win 
the uh, persuade them that there was an argument for building more houses. And I found that the best arguments were neither classic right-wing arguments about economic efficiency, nor classic left-wing arguments just about equality. They were actually intergenerational arguments saying, but hang on, I know where you live. I know the estate that you're on. You're living in a row of houses built in the 1960s and 1970s for you guys when you were young by previous generations. The previous generation discharged an obligation to you and you have a similar obligation to promote houses for your kids so that they can enjoy what an older generation did for you. That is quite a powerful argument that people respond to. And indeed, if you look at the changes in social attitudes on house building, there has been a big shift towards a support. It used to be 10 years ago, about 25% of people said there should be more houses built in my area. That's now up to about 50% of people saying there should be more houses built in my area. So I think attitudes to housing have shifted as people have seen what it means for their kids as they try to get started on the housing ladder. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, optimistic uh, at the end there. Um, okay, um, I'm not seeing any more questions from the audience. Um, Matthias, do you have any final, final questions to ask? Um, no, I have no questions left, but again, from my side and from the students' side um, that are in this call and that will see this recording later on, uh, I wanted to thank you again for that interesting presentation. Um, it has been really enlightening from our perspective to see um, what future we are running into and especially see some ways of how we can solve it and how we can secure ourselves. Um, so thank you very much again. And um, yes. Good. Well, thank you very much, Matthias. And thank you, Brian. Thanks very much for the invitation uh, to speak at this event. I do appreciate it. Pleasure. Um, and on behalf of King's College, thank you enormously for that uh, presentation and discussion. It was extremely interesting and very thought provoking. So uh, thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thanks very much.